On one side of the weedy trough where train tracks sleep, sunken six feet down and nailed with eight-inch spikes into the floor of God's old, dry, upstate New York, a parking lot retards the trees, whose slow and silent war against the asphalt's fallen wall of darkness goes unnoticed by the drivers of these pacers, gremlins, sobs, 120,000 miles odometered, but still in Puddlebury here. Population 667. If one guy dies or moves down to the Bronx to drive a cab, the devil may appear in hat and threadbare cutaway tuxedo sitting in a burned out dining car whose ribs exposed make prison bars of sunshine on the desiccated grass. This is the water level line that died in 1968, around the time the busboy held the broken senator, his head, whose blood and Aeschylus flowed out through grates and drain pipes, copper, concrete, lead, that bore his spirit through the sewers to the sea. Built in 1853, the New York Central lived to age 117. Slaves had watched it pass while glossy crickets sprang into the sky, while feral dogs ran from the noise, while kids threw clods that burst against the cattle car. On one side thrives Wheat's useless distant cousin measuring the wind, but opposite Beyond the track's unnatural riverbed where moats and gnats, black flies, mosquitoes ride the currents of the helpless summer air, the parking lot, it's only early June, Fahrenheit 117, awaits the mercy of the starlight's cool blue trance. Nobody's here until the 667th man, Horatio, a piece of him, comes barefoot to the bank with bourbon and a fishing rod, no line at all, sits down dangling his birthday legs and singing the McDonald's 1970s commercials with the dripping smile, not dead yet. Ten towns away, a church of steel and fiberglass is full, weird with futuristic arcs and knobs, a clever 1988 idea that fairly quickly lost its charm and turned embarrassing. There's the water tower, a day-glow rainbow on its brow. There is the maple shot by lightning when the tramp was nine. He saw it strike late afternoon, the thunderstorm alive, gigantic like the one that stabbed and stabbed at Martin Luther's heart until the fear of dad subdued him. Rain dumping and vanishing, dumping again, when the white bolt drove a rod of cinders down the maple's throat, spit ashes, sparks, a bird-like yellow flame that flashed and disappeared, and one brief hand of smoke that spread away forever. Jesus saves. The offshore drilling platform blows sky high when Athena, like a meteor from heaven, dives down to the center of the earth where Judas, Cassius, and Brutus lie in agonies of ice and fire forever. The aircraft carrier's maneuvers end when angels tear the steel skin off the bulkheads and the empty planes, like darts, are thrown deep into Pluto. Magic, cargo cults, and symphonies, mesmerism, NLP, that star upon which Jiminy Cricket wished so many times. Hypnosis, dreams, a THC-induced euphoric hike along a mountain stream, the best of luck, a silent temple in Japan, Maitreya Buddha walking through a door in time onto the Tonight Show's floodlit set. Deliver us 
from dead America. Let all the oil run out before the trains from San Francisco and New York set out to fill the FEMA camps with slaves, or better still, remember, Jesus saves. This book is a set of elegies for President Kennedy. Now, the book turns upon a 26-second home movie of the president getting shot to death. And one of the things that it's about is the way that you catch yourself wishing for a different outcome. When you see it the 10,000th time, you still want, well, maybe they'll swerve to the left and something will change. If anything could change, there could be a different outcome. The butterfly effect is the name we give to this phenomenon. We imagine that if we could go back X number of years in the past and shift the wing of one butterfly, one millimeter to the right, sensitivity to initial conditions and the entropic nature of our world might cause that tiny change to propagate out into enormous differences for the better. That is the nature of this fantasy. Z-179. Suppose you're in a spaceship and you go outside in your amazing little suit to make repairs. Somehow the tether breaks and now you're floating several feet from the hull and the handle standing on nothing, perfectly still. You're free, but you can't stay. There's no air or water to shove against and swim through back to life and work. If you could only throw some garbage out behind that would propel you forward with the same momentum, even an eyelash, a fingernail, nickels and dimes would have you slowly sailing towards sweet, solid pains and rivets, terra firma at the stainless breast of mankind's genius but everything expendable is sealed inside what you can't live without. At this stage of the film, the president has got bullets in his body and there are more on their way. What comes through me now? These seeds of hell. The mother's body and the father's word are planted in my arteries to stop me, and the sound of many waters folds the centuries to come, tightly like the flag some military funeral presents to parents of the fool that left his bed for destiny and came back rotting in a plastic bag. The sound of water falling into water, or of wind into wind, replaces every sound of revving engine or alarm from someone else inside the car who's shot or scared. I am alone now with this ancient sound so new to me that carries home no meaning, only presence, presence, and then emptiness. First, my hearing vanishes, and then I follow it. Thank you.